Welcome back, everyone. By the time you see this video, I will be on the Western Front in Verdun, uh, going to France to make some content uh, in Verdun and about the Meuse Argonne, uh, which was the major American offensive of the war. So I thought it'd be fun to do a little pub quiz of World War I questions. I hope these are challenging. Uh, anytime I can get some stuff wrong, I feel good because I feel like maybe that means it was somewhat challenging enough to where it wasn't super easy. Doesn't mean it wasn't easy for some of you who might be experts on some of these particular areas of uh, interest. But uh, I'll put the link down in the description if you want to check out this channel uh, without my commentary, see any of their videos. Uh, as always with these quizzes, I will try to wait and give you guys a chance to think about the question yourself before I answer it. And once we have the answer, I'll try to maybe talk a little bit about the historical topic if I know something about it. So let's go ahead and dive into this one. This is a World War I quiz. Make sure you post your scores in the comments below. If you need more time for each question, adjust the playback speed. And ah, the quiz sense. will start in three, two, one. So, yeah, what I'll do with these is I'll wait toward the end. Our uh, first country to declare war was Austria-Hungary, who declared war on Serbia. So it's B. Yep. That was what triggered that whole system of alliances. Germany's invasion of which country provoked Britain to declare war on Germany? Ah, yes. This is D, Belgium, who did fantastic in slowing the Germans down during their attack through the country. King Albert of the Belgians. Just saw the car and his uniform and the couch he died on, which are in Vienna, but this happened in Sarajevo. In fact, Sabaton has a song called Sarajevo that talks about the beginning of the war. Ooh, Battle of Tannenberg. This is between the Germans and the Russians. This is a major defeat for the Russians early in the war on the Eastern Front. Happened in 1914. So far, so good. I expect them to get tougher. There's 30 questions total. Well, we already answered this one. The Battle of Tannenberg was a major German victory. Probably one of their biggest of the war, especially on the Eastern Front. Ooh. I may or may not be on this battlefield when you watch this video. Tannenberg was not a long battle. Verdun lasted over 300 days. 303 days, specifically, I think. Yeah. Yeah. My friend JD's got a whole series going right now on the History Underground from Verdun. I already answered this one too because I told you this is where I'm going to be. So let's talk a little bit about Verdun, which happens in France. Uh, this is a battle that kicks off in the very early part of 1916. Uh, it's a German offensive to uh, take one of the most, most fortified cities on the Western Front. Um, after, in the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870-71, uh, Alsace-Lorraine goes from being French to being German, and that puts Verdun pretty close to the front line territory between France and Germany. And it's always known that there's the potential for further conflict there, and so France starts building up fortifications in the late 1870s into the 1880s, 1890s. And Verdun becomes one of these heavily fortified cities, multiple rings of forts and trenches and big guns. And you're going to see some of those forts from the videos that I make over there. Um, and so this, this battle begins with a one million artillery shell bombardment along about a 20 mile front. Uh, just an insane amount of artillery is launched. Uh, it could be heard 100 miles away and... Uh, it's a bloody, bloody battle. Pretty much everybody in the French army is rotated in through Verdun at some point during 1916. Uh, and probably contrary to popular belief, uh, Erich von Falkenhayn, who is the uh, German commander, uh, would later on say that his attempt was never to take and hold Verdun, but it was rather to take Verdun, kind of a bite and hold tactic. Uh, it was basically to bleed France white trying to defend Verdun. Um, that may be more revisionist history on his part, but uh, certainly bled both sides white 
over 300,000 dead in that battle. How many months did the battle? We already just talked about this one. Uh, it'd be about 10 months, 300 days. So we're doing a lot of questions about Verdun, I see. Ooh, I'm not real good with the tanks. Um, is that a German tank? If it's a German tank, it's the A7V Sturmpanzerwagen. That's the only German tank there was. So it's got to be C. Germany only made like 20 tanks during the war. The Allies made thousands of them. How were Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany and Tsar Nicholas II of Russia related? Um, third cousin sounds about right. I don't know why I was thinking they were second cousins. Nicholas's wife was actually a first cousin to Wilhelm. Um, so Nicholas II is distant cousins to Wilhelm. He's a first cousin to uh, King George V of the UK. They look like they could have been brothers. They look so much alike, especially when they both had beards. Um, and they kind of do a, a joking play on this. In uh, There was a recent movie, The King's Man, I think it is, where you have the same actor play, Kaiser Wilhelm, Tsar Nicholas, and King George. Um, but yeah, uh, Wilhelm II was the oldest grandchild of Queen Victoria. George V was a grandchild of Queen Victoria, and Nicholas II's wife was a grandchild of Queen Victoria. Nicholas and George, I think their mothers were sisters. Battle of the Falkland Islands was fought between British and German armies. There's a couple of battles over there around South America. British and German navies, I should say, not armies. Was Germany's pre-World War I plan to quickly defeat France before attacking Russia? It's the Schlieffen plan. Uh, and there's debate about how much they really were sticking to the Schlieffen plan. If they'd really, really, really stuck to it, they might have actually succeeded. They... The problem with the Schlieffen plan was its inflexibility. Uh, and so by the time you actually have uh, German high command actually making changes to it, they make the wrong changes. Um, but basically what it was was we have to very quickly defeat France, defeat them in like weeks if possible. There's a very specific timeline of how quickly they needed to be where, and the Belgians screw all of that up by holding out at places like Liège. And then you very quickly rush all of your divisions to the east to deal with Russia, who you know you can't defeat both France and Russia at the same time. If you can defeat one and then get over to the other one before Russia can, big, slow Russia can mobilize their army, then you're okay. Didn't work out that way. The intercepted Zimmerman telegraph was sent from Germany to... Mexico. It was basically Mexico. If you side with us in the war, we'll give you all that territory back that you lost to the United States in the aftermath of the Mexican War. Uh, Germany had had its lines of communication to North America cut in the early parts of the war. There's underground, like there's underwater cables. And so they were actually kind of piggybacking, piggybacking off of British lines. And so the British were listening to everything they were saying and they intercepted this Zimmerman telegraph. And then Germany 100% admitted to it. They're like, yeah, we totally did send that. And it was one of the main reasons why the U.S. entered the war. Which of these topics was not discussed in the Zimmerman telegram? Um, well, it's got to be alliance with Japan because Japan's already on the Allied side at this point. So unrestricted submarine warfare was basically the German answer to the British blockade of German ports. Uh, it was to use submarines to sink any ships that came within a certain zone around the UK. Um, and that's why you have ships like the Lusitania get sunk. 
uh, during the first phase of unrestricted submarine warfare. And in hindsight, if I'm being completely objective and honest, there's really very little difference between unrestricted submarine warfare and the blockade of the Germans. In fact, the blockade was much more devastating to civilians than unrestricted submarine warfare ever was. First to use tanks in battle. I'm sure we're going to get further questions about this, but it was at Fleur Corselet at the Somme by the British, September 1916. September 15th, I think. Tanks were first used by the British in what battle? It would be the Battle of the, the Somme. I already mentioned that. It, the Somme was not just July 1st, 1916, which is the part everybody talks about. It went till November. Fleur Corselet was one of the battles within the larger Somme offensive. The Battle of the Somme is really more than just a battle. It's, a, it's an entire offensive. Russia withdrew from the war. Ooh. Got to be 1917, right? That's the year that Tsar Nicholas abdicates. Uh, the Russian Civil War kind of gets going. Yeah. Just in time for the Americans to join. Ooh, like I said, I'm not great with tanks. That looks like a French tank, though. I'm going to say it's a Renault FT-17. French light tank, which were kind of the workhorses late in the war. Those big, massive tanks that you see, like the saint Chamon, were not used as much by the end of the war. They were very unreliable. Um, as I mentioned already, th these are French tanks, the FT-17. Americans used a lot of French tanks. Americans didn't have their own tanks, didn't use a lot of their own artillery. They were using a lot of French tanks, planes, artillery. Even weapons in some cases. German U-boat sunk which ship on May, in May 1915, which fueled anti-German sentiment in the UK and the US? That would be the Lusitania off the southern coast of Ireland. It was definitely carrying munitions and stuff for the war, in addition to a lot of passengers. Which was not a World War I battle. Well, we know the Somme was. Tannenberg, we've already talked about. Uh, Sarah Kamish is probably in the Ottoman Empire. I'm going to say Khan. Khan's over like toward Normandy. I was just just there a couple months ago. Definitely not a place there would have been a battle. Or just naval battle of World War I. Uh, so Cornell was a battle. Uh, that's another one I think that's fought off of South America. We talked about Falkland, but it's definitely Jutland or Jutland. Um, biggest battle, of the war, uh, naval battle of the war by far. And King George the Sixth, the future King George the Sixth, the Queen Elizabeth the Second's father, was a naval officer there, a turret gunner on the uh, HMS Collingwood. Japan declared war on Germany as a part of World War One. They were kind of opportunistic, like several countries who joined the war, Italy same way, trying to get something out of it. All these countries became independent states after World War One, except. Norway. I think Norway already was an independent state. Estonia, Latvia become independent from Russia. Hungary becomes independent from the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. What's the name of the German tank? Well, we already answered that question, didn't we? Because we saw it a little bit, bit ago. Uh, it's the A7V Sturmpanzerwagen. They only made, like I said, about 20 of them. Armored fighting vehicle, basically, is what it was called. Which was not an ally of Germany during World War I. Well, um, Bulgaria, Ottoman Empire, and Austria-Hungary all definitely were, so it's got to be Mon Montenegro. They're right there next to Serbia, so. Battle of Jutland occurred, occurred 97 kilometers off the coast of... Denmark. I actually almost mentioned this earlier when we are talking about Jutland. It's Denmark. I hear they have a really cool museum related to that battle there. Ludendorff Offensive was launched in what year? Uh, is, that, is that the Kaiserschlag? That's 1918. 
Yeah. It's actually a series of offensives. They have code names like Michael and Georgette and Blucher York. Um, and this was really Germany's last ditch attempt to win the war in the West before the Americans arrive in force. Uh, and it really helped, um, caused Germany to peter out to the point where they just had nothing left. Flowers known for remembrance of World War I's Armistice Day. I did a whole video talking about how that came about. It's the poppies. It starts with um, J uh, Colonel John McRae and his um, poem in Flanders Fields, which he writes in 1915 uh, as he's looking at the grave of a friend of his that was killed. Uh, he ends up la later dying in the war, and it was actually an American who first proposed the idea of poppies being a symbol of remembrance. And it's funny then because Americans are, out of all of the, the Western allies, Americans are the ones who least use poppies as a symbol of remembrance. Um, but yeah, I mean, you see them absolutely everywhere anytime you go to the Western Front. It's the name of the republic that governed Germany after World War I. I don't even know if these other ones are actually places, but it's the Weimar Republic, which governed Germany until 1933, when you know who took over. So I guess that's it. Do we have any extra ones? Oh, bonus question. What was the name of the first British tank? Oh, it was like the... It's something silly, like the Mark I or something, isn't it? Or is that just one of their test ones? I don't really know. I'll write your answer in the comments. We're not even going to get the answer. All right, great we? job. Make sure you... All right, so uh, let me know how you did. Uh, I think... Did I get them all? I might have gotten them all. I don't even pay attention to how many I get. Let me know in the comment section below how you did. Um, these are just fun ways to talk about a little bit of history. We're, we're, we're playing along with each other, uh, but we're also hopefully learning something along the way. So let me know your thoughts. If you have a quiz you'd like me to do, let me know that as well. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.